morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, and it's the first 16 verses. If you want to follow it in the Bibles that are by the, in the chairs, it's uh, page 1175. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who ascended as the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay, Mike, you met us and you came back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, we were praying hard that you would come back. Um, thank you. We were thrilled last night that you were willing to share with us, be open with us about your own faith and how God's been at work in your life. And we're thrilled to have you come and speak to us. So let me pray for you now. Father, thank you for your servant, Mike. Thank you for the way that you have used him in ministry over many years. And thank you that you have plans to use him in ministry this weekend as he comes to minister to us. Please, Lord, would you use your servant that we might hear your voice and that by your spirit we might be led more closely to walk with you, both as individuals and as a church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James, thank you. I um, appreciate your welcome and uh, your introduction. I have to say I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> um, it's lovely to be back with you today, and uh, I hope that I, somebody gave me some feedback that is a little hard to hear at the back. If you're struggling, will you wave your arm in the air and I'll try and adjust the volume. So um, for 20 years, almost, give a year or two, uh, I was a bishop in the Church of England, and one of your responsibilities uh, as a bishop, I believe, is to support what um, your colleagues are doing in local churches. I have long believed that the local church, to quote Bill Hybels, is the hope of the world. And therefore, any time investing in local churches is a good thing. But one of the things that became abundantly clear to me was that churches, a bit like families, which are meant to be places of great blessing, can become places where people get badly damaged. And a common scenario that I would run into would be a church where two or three people who had a propensity for toxic behavior 
would be allowed to run riot across the congregation and nobody loved them enough to challenge them. One of the things that marks out churches is because we you know, talk about love a lot and, you know, I mean, sometimes I think we make the gospel sound a bit like Hyde Anderson in San Francisco in 1966. You know, it's a love thing. And, and in a way, that's right. But if, if loving means we don't love people enough, then the danger is we'll damage them. And I, what I've been asked to talk to you about is authenticity. I, I know that's a word that the Blair government kind of overused uh, in the early 2000s. But it's not unimportant. What it means is, at least the way I'm going to tackle it means that, uh, there are things that in Christ we are invited to believe. And if we believe them, these should have ramifications in the way we live our lives. In other words, what we believe should impact the way we behave, but in most of us, don't put your hands up, there is a credibility gap between the things we claim to believe and the way that we behave. I've never forgotten one night, I invited an ordinary round to our house for supper and forgot to tell my wife that he was a vegetarian and she had cooked fillet steak comes around and uh, I just, you know, I said grace. And in the middle of grace, I remembered this guy's a vegetarian. So I said to her, I'm terribly sorry. I completely forgot to tell Anthea that uh, you're a vegetarian and she's cooked some fillet steak. He said, that's fine. And he ate it. And I thought, well, what kind of vegetarian is fillet steak? <laughs> It's like when we see peace protest protesters out on the street beating the living daylights out of policemen. You think, so that's peace. But what about you, friend? What is the credibility gap between what you claim to believe and the way you behave, the way you behave with your spouse if you are blessed enough to have one? The way you behave when no one's looking. A temptation is, say, so you're flicking through on your computer screen and some unworthy images come up and suddenly you start flicking. I want to talk to you about is how we might close this credibility gap. And obviously, this session, um, James kind of subtitled Rooted in Christ, which is why I picked Ephesians. I think if I was uh, on uh, Desert Island Discs and was asked to decide what book I, I might, of the Bible, not, you know, just alter the rules a bit. If I could only take one book in the Bible with me, what would it be? Ephesians would be one I would seriously consider because I think it explains very clearly the title deeds of our faith. In John chapter 15... Jesus talks about us abiding in Christ, abiding in him. Um, I came across this definition of abiding, which came from a great old saint of the church, who amazingly was a bishop as well, called J.C. Ryle. And he said this, he said, To abide in Christ means to keep up a constant habit of consistent close communication with him, with God to be always leaning on him, resting on him, and using him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. I wonder how many of us could say that 24 hours a day, apart from when we're asleep, 365 days of the year, 366 in a leap year, that we're abiding in Christ in the way that J.C. Ryle put it there. To be always leaning on him, resting on him, and using him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. If you were to read the whole of the book of Epistle to the Ephesians, and I would recommend this, you will see that two words occur all the time, in him, or alternatively, 
in Christ. Everything, everything we are, everything we ever will be, if we're Christ's followers, should be rooted, rooted in Him. We are called to abide in Him. It's not like you come to church on a Sunday and feign kind of a religiosity and then go out of this place and for the other six days of the week do what the dickens you like. No, this is 24 hour a day, 365 days a year, abiding. Constantly being aware of his presence. I saw this last week, the brother Andrew died and some of you remember that he was God's smuggler. He took Bibles behind the Iron Curtain and he wrote a book which is called Practicing the Presence of God. You should take a look at that. Because it will make a massive difference to your life if you are conscious of having an abiding relationship with him. Let's just go back for a moment. Authenticity is what we claim to believe should show forth clearly in our lives. Paul in Ephesians 4, I mean, if you know Paul's epistles, you will know that he spends, you know, I mean, I never write letters like this, right? Uh, but you, you will know that he spends the first bit of his letters saying, look, this is the way you are, you're supposed to believe. Ephesians chapter 1, verse through to the middle of chapter 3. Paul's telling us what we should. It's got some astounding verses in there. I don't know whether you've noticed them, but if you uh, were to look at Ephesians chapter 1, uh, and I think it's verse 3, uh, you would read there that Paul says, God has blessed us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you get this? You are blessed with every spiritual blessing if you are in Christ. You're like, I don't know about spiritual blessings. You know, I'm much more interested in material blessings. You remember what spiritual blessings are? They're things like forgiveness, grace, the kind of things that God wants to um, turbocharge in your life that you might become more the person uh, that he wants you to be. And then the verse I referenced last night, the verse that cut through my hard heart when I was an unbeliever. Uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, by grace you've been saved. Someone say amen. amen. It's by grace you've been saved, not be, by your efforts. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. See, in most churches, in most churches which would describe themselves as evangelical churches, there are people who sit there Sunday by Sunday thinking that somehow they've got to earn their way into heaven. That's not what the scripture says. It says we're saved by our grace. Saved by his grace. And that we're saved in order to do good works. In other words, it's not your good works that will save you. It is that you are saved to do good works for him. Authentic Christianity will be concerned not just for its own members, but for the world around it as well. My goodness, not now, but I mean... There is a heck of a lot to be anxious about in our world just now. Is that true? It really is. So, um, Paul begins in Ephesians chapter 4, and he uh, says to us, first of all, he, he just, having told us what we're supposed to believe, what Paul then does is, he said, and this is what it's meant to look like in your lives and in God's church. It's an amazing chapter, chapter 4, if you read it carefully and meditate on it. But Paul says that, um, first of all, this has a, uh, being in Christ has an impact on our relationships in the church, right? I'm going to think a little more about that in the next session. But uh, for now, let's just note this, what Paul says in relation to our relationships in, within the church. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
See, what Paul's saying is here is there is a qualitative difference. They should be self-evident in our relationships. Churches are supposed to be like greenhouses, places where growth is turbocharged. And one of the ways this happens is, James has emphasized this uh, all through his introductions, and that is, this will work better if our relationships one with another are better with each other, and also that we actually get to know one another. I mean, whether you got to know me better through me telling you that the queen feeds corgis under a table, I have no idea, but look, here's the thing. Uh, Gordon Jones, in his memorable book, I can't remember the title of it, written in about 1968, says, the trouble with churches is people bounce off each other like billiard balls. There is no attempt to get beyond the surface. When I first went to a church I I was rector of, I never forget, there have been people sitting in that church, and they'd be very quick to tell you this, that they'd been in that church for 55 years. And yet, they'd say stuff like, um, you know that lady who sits in the third pew from the front who wears those ridiculous hats? Didn't even know her name. 55 years in the same church. Didn't even know the person's name. I mean, you're cheating, you've got badges on, right? (laughs) Friends, this is not good enough. And, and we need to take far more notice in our churches. And, and I'll explain why that is a little later. Far more concern about the qualitative nature of our relationships together in the body of Christ. Uh, David Watson always used to say that the church should be like a bright light on a dark night that attracts the bugs towards it. He said that's the way the church should be. Just by the way we are should attract people. And yet I can guarantee that in this town and towns up and down this country, villages, whatever, there are people who lie in bed on a Sunday morning, not feeling great about life, wondering how on earth they're going to cope. And the very last thing they would think about is coming anywhere near a church. You know, and this is, uh, this is even more painful if you start to look at it uh, in various income groups. When you look at income groups C1 and C2, in other words, people who are on the margins of, you know, enough, I mean, it's less than 1% of them that would ever think of going near a church. Why is that? So I want to describe to you this morning, because I have to be off in 25 minutes, or James has got a loaded gun here that he'll put through my... Uh, I'm going to talk to you about three drivers that come out of this, which actually would really drive the church in the right direction. The first thing is, Paul says we're called to unity. Remember, Paul had never heard of Methodist or Baptist or anything like that. When Paul talked about unity, he's talking about the local church, talking about you. And he says, you know, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What Paul is saying here is that unity is something that's given to us, but is easily disrupted, so we've got to work hard at maintaining it. Thus, be patient and kind, forbearing, all these things which we actually find very difficult. You know, somebody once did a corruption of something that Jesus said. You know, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered... Uh, There am I. Somebody said, where two or three gathered, there's bound to be trouble. What does it mean to love each other? Well, the word that's most commonly used in the Bible, you know this, is the word agape. A word that appeals primarily to the will, not just to our feelings. It's not saying you've got to kind of feel gooey about everybody in church. It's saying that you've got to set your will to want the best for them. You cannot like everybody. Is that true? Well, you're looking at me, I'm getting the message. (laughs) Um, So unity is a really big deal. Um, Philosopher Schopenhauer had this interesting uh, picture of the porcupines. You may have heard about it. And uh, Schopenhauer noticed that in winter... 
Porcupines had to huddle together to keep warm, otherwise they would die. But if they got too close together, they'd kill each other with their spines. And, and what Schopenhauer says is, togetherness is a good thing, but sometimes when we are overly together, and there are some smaller churches which are like this, they become impenetrable. It doesn't work. If, you be, if they become too close, it happens in a lot of, um, see the youth workers sitting under my feet here, happens in small youth groups. The kids in the youth group get to know each other so well, it can be very difficult to be a new kid trying to join the group. But the point is, Paul says, the church should be together. We should be unified. We should be big enough to deal with our differences. In fact, I think one of the things that the church could be a great witness to the current culture in which we live is to show that we can disagree with, with each other and still remain together. I hope cancel culture never finds its way into our churches. So unity is a big deal. And Paul here does the extraordinary thing. Incidentally... If you ever get a Jehovah's Witness come to your door and tell you that there is no such thing as the Holy Trinity, point them in the direction of Ephesians chapter 4. So Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul is saying here that the Holy Trinity is diverse, Father, Son, Spirit, but they are unified together. And that is the model for our relationships. We're not all called to be the same. What we are called to be is to be together in Christ, despite our differences, despite our petty prejudices, despite the fact that there are some people we take to immediately and some people who we give a very wide berth to. If you don't find that challenging, you don't understand what's being said here. The second thing is, ironically, Paul says the church is supposed to be unified, but it's also supposed to be diversified. In chapter uh, seven, uh, verse 7 of chapter 4, Paul says, To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. The scholars will tell you that what Paul's referring to is our spiritual giftedness. You can read about those in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Neither list of gifts is meant to be exhaustive. See, there's one gift that I found a really helpful thing in building a church. And that is the gift of hospitality. Some people have it, some people don't have it. And my wife went to a house group uh, in our, one of our previous churches, which was hosted by people who own nine cats, thus nine litter trays. Exactly. Somebody grimacing here. Uh, and they, uh, when we split into small groups, in the, in the, uh, we went into the dining room, which was basically an aquarium, <laughs> full of eels. Exactly. And you think to yourself... It's this hospitality that I come into a place and feel immediately sick <laughs> and secondarily terrified. <laughs> See, some people have a gift of hospitality and you need to find them. You know, I used to, the biggest deal in forming uh, house groups in, uh, in my church, we have 44 of them, was finding people who, who had a gift of hospitality and people who had a gift of leading and te uh, sorry, teaching and leadership. Because if either of those are missing in a house group, people are going to really struggle with it. That's not my point. That is a bonus piece of information for you. <laughs> so um, what Paul's talking about here is the diversity of our different gifts. And uh, again, my experience is that there are many people who sit in churches Sunday by Sunday, week in, week out, who do not have a clue what their spiritual gifts are. 
And in my experience, I mean, this is my experience, so it doesn't mean it's true. In my experience, most people have three primary gift areas. And you need to know what those are. And Paul says what we're supposed to do with those gifts is to glorify God. Spiritual gifts are never about drawing attention to yourself. They're about honoring God. So spiritual gifts are to glorify God, to edify the church, and to serve the world. We don't want all the spiritual gifts locked away in churches. If you are a great doctor or a great... We need you to exercise your ministry outside the church with the full blessing and prayer support of the wider church. If you're a great entrepreneur, you need the support of the church to pray for you. But we are diverse. And here's the thing. I I remember, um, I'm sure she would tell you if she was here, but... um, there was a time when we first kind of were involved in, in, you know, tangentially, cautiously, slightly scared of the renewal movement. And, and we confronted people who spoke in tongues. And I think we got the idea, you know, which is the old Pentecostal idea, that unless you speak in tongues, you're not, you know, you're not filled with the Spirit. I don't believe that's a biblical view at all, but you know it's one that the Pentecostals will push hard at you. And uh, so we kind of got the idea that we must have the gift of, of tongues. Must have it. But the very thing is, because it's a gift, you know, the Spirit will give that gift where he wills, not where I will, but where he wills it. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, forbearance, all these kind of qualitative things. And what what that list is uh, uh, communicating is that all of us are supposed to have all of those qualities in our lives. That makes it different than the gift of the Spirit, which not all of us will have all the gifts. Although I have met one or two sickening people who... (laughs) who got rather too many gifts. Uh, you know, you meet them occasionally and, and you admire them and then you gradually stop admiring them. <laughs> so this diversity is something to celebrate, not something to be seen as a problem. And you know in our world, you know, there's a big growth in this thing called identity politics, which, you know, as critics say, I think with some justification simply tribalizes our society. And what we don't want to become is a tribal church. I don't think a tribal church would be attractive to anybody apart from somebody who thought tribalism was a great idea, which presumably you don't. No, we're supposed to, we're called to unity, but we are also called to celebrate the diversity of our difference in relation to our spiritual gifting. You imagine, and often this is what it takes, that you're going to have to reimagine what church could be like in order to implement these drivers strongly at the heart of who you are. And Paul says, And to come back to my point, that the church is supposed to be a greenhouse. It's supposed to be that place where we grow, where we create the conditions where as individuals we can grow in the body. You know, one of the things that Jesus clearly thought was that we learn better together. That's why he taught his disciples, that's why he taught crowds together. We learn better together. That's why I guess if you can make anything of a you know, time of reflection or splitting into a small group and talking with people, I mean, I suppose the danger of choosing your own group is you'll choose the people who agree with you, which may not be the most... Uh, it may, may be rewarding in one way, but a bit less rewarding in other ways. But look, here's the thing. Um, Jesus clearly understood that we will learn better together. And the outcome of that, 
And this is marvelous. I mean, you know, it's hard to even imagine that a church could be like this. But, but here's the thing, right? Paul says this, um, look, um, we, we've, you've got all these gifts, and you've got these orders of ministry as well, which are different. Some are evangelists, some are pastors and teachers. And the purpose of that is to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Look, you know the default of our churches, the age group default is, um, I mean, uh, I often go into churches, I'm 73, I often go to churches where I'm one of the younger people there. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, God loves old people. He does. You know, he doesn't make jokes about them or anything. He loves them. And, um, you you know, we should never forget that. Um, But listen, what we can't do is to confuse old age with maturity. They're different things. Interestingly, I think the scriptural witness is that it is more likely that people who are older will have more wisdom. So you remember when Paul wrote to the young church leader, Timothy, part of his point was that uh, his teaching to Timothy was based on the idea that Timothy was unusual in that he was a young church leader. He said to Timothy, don't let anybody despise your youth. But he never said, just because you're old, you're mature. I mean, your body might be. But some of the most childish people I've met have been older people. I dare to say my wife has occasionally accused me of being childish, <laughs> despite my great age. But in general, wisdom you know, comes with experience. And wisdom is not the same as intelligence. We live in a highly intelligent world. There are a lot of people with a lot of smart qualifications who can do amazing things. Praise God for them. But they're not always wise. And wisdom is something that Scripture uh, appreciates. And also it appreciates, God appreciates maturity. And I'm going to talk to you a little more about that in the next session that we have. Um, because I think my time's run out. Uh, so here's the three things that I want you to think about. Unity, diversity, and maturity. And if you can begin to reimagine what church would be like based around those drivers, you will start to think about something beautiful. It will be a place where we will be healed and where we will grow, and where we will become more into the likeness of him who saved us, Jesus Christ our Lord. In him, in him, in Christ, in him. These blessings can be yours, and you can live a kind of life that will be truly different, and who knows, even maybe a little more authentic. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing revelation of your plan for the salvation of the world revealed to us in Holy Scripture. Lord, forgive us when we've been over-obsessed with our own well-being and our own uh, knitting. And Lord, have uh, forgotten that there is a world out there that you love. And Lord, your plan A is that your church would play a role in the transformation of that world. But Lord, you know too that there's a lot that we need to rethink and reimagine and get right. Not, Lord, new trendy ideas, but Lord, the truth of your word, uh, interpreted for our times clearly. And Lord, we pray that you'd always remind us that on the days when we really struggle with it all, 
Father, you've not left us alone with this, but you've let, sent your Holy Spirit to empower us and embolden us and make us obedient to the life you've called us to. So, Lord, would you please excite us about this? Lord, would you please fire our imaginations? Lord, that we may truly together become the people that you call us to be. And, Lord, that we might infect your world with the power of the gospel. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And the people who agreed said together... <laughs>